Shabbat Shalom. I want to come in here and make a little video. Um, just got some things kind of running around in my head right now and I want to share them with you. Um, I just got finished with a really, really good class. Now it's for my job and it's business stuff and, and uh, the things that I'm doing there. But we had a segment this afternoon about paradigms and paradigm shifts. And it really was quite a fascinating, fascinating segment. To start with, you know, big question is what is a paradigm? And essentially a paradigm is a set of rules by which, or boundaries or limits, by which we judge and determine and make decisions. Um, or how we, how we measure information and, and utilize it. And what's interesting about a paradigm is that often you cannot see, or the person with the paradigm, and we all have paradigms, but the person with the paradigm is not aware of or information outside of their paradigm is literally invisible to them. They can't see it. It doesn't fit. So because their rules don't work with it, they don't know what to do with it, and so they tend to find rules to ignore it or minimize it or somehow make it go away. Interesting. So I'm sitting here in class watching this and of course they're talking about it in terms of business and so some great examples for example uh, or, or some great examples they gave us. Um, Galileo in the 1600s I think um, with the uh, telescope that he had began to notice some um, patterns and things going on in the universe that demonstrated to him that the, the model that they used as the Earth at the center of the solar system was wrong. It was not, um, not Earth-centric, but it was actually solar-centric. Now, I know some of y'all may argue with that, and it's okay. Um, maybe I don't have my paradigm figured out yet, right? But... Uh, the, the point being that literally he, when he uh, explained this discovery, was uh, forced to, he, he wasn't forced to recant, but what they tried to do, the church literally tried to, uh, they threatened him with torture and with death if he didn't back down, which he did. He ceased to teach it and he lived under house arrest the rest of his life. And yet, what he came to, the conclusions he came to, changed the history of uh, astronomy and the study of the stars for, you know, a great deal, great, a long period of time. Another example that they gave us, there was a man who had come up with this little discovery uh, that he could take a a flash of a bright light and an image and superimpose it on a piece of paper using a, a little gunpowder type uh, dust that he had formulated. And so he took it to a company named Kodak and uh, had Kodak take a look at it. A scientist sat down with him, looked at it, and then said, this is just snake oil. This isn't something we're interested in. And they showed him the door. And of course, within a few years, Xerox was born and everything that happens with copying machines and Kodak missed out on a on a huge multi 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 million dollar opportunity. Another example that they shared was Swiss, uh, uh, Switzerland, Swiss watchmakers, best in the world, known all over for their their incredible watchmaking skills. And a a research company or something in Switzerland, I don't remember the details, came up with something interesting that uh, was very accurate, that was electronic, called a, that ultimately was called a quartz watch. Well, Swiss watchmakers looked at it and said, that can't work. It doesn't have a mainspring. It doesn't have all the gears. It doesn't have all the fine bearings we make. Um, that's, it, it, it's not even possible. And so the the particular idea was not even patented, but it was put on display at the World Watchmakers Congress or something like that, some, some big shindig where watchmakers from over the world would come and take a look at it. And a couple Japanese businessmen walked by, looked at it, kind of asked a few questions, and they went home. 
and Seiko was born. And the uh, you know at the time that that happened, there were about 65,000 watchmakers in Switzerland. Within something like five to seven years, 50,000 of them were out of work. It was a shift in paradigm. The, the Swiss watchmakers were so wrapped up in their paradigm for how things are supposed to work with a watch that they couldn't see an electronic option that would be more accurate and better. And really, we have these kind of paradigms all the time in, um, in business. We see it, you know, Blockbuster uh, didn't understand that they needed to make a shift from CDs and DVDs that went out to uh, online streaming. And Netflix was born and you know Blockbuster is no more or pretty much is no more so you get the idea well the whole time this is going on in class my head is absolutely exploding I'm sitting here going oh my goodness oh my goodness oh my goodness and I'm understanding something I'm understanding part of the reason why so many people don't see Torah or so many people don't see uh, marriage, polygyny, authority and headship, all these kind of things, because they're in a paradigm that doesn't compute. They see Jacob with four wives and it doesn't fit their laws for monogamy only, so they have to find a way to make it go away or an excuse for why that doesn't work, etc. And we see this over and over and over in Scripture. We see we see God, for example, with regards to Torah. He, he says, you know, um, the law of the Lord is, is righteous, enlightening the eyes, it enlivens the heart, it restores the soul, all these kind of things. We see, uh, uh, blessed is the man who delights in the law, and on his law doth he meditate day and night. And we see um, how blessed are those who walk in the Torah of Yahweh. Uh, and I forget, that's the first, first couple of verses, or first verse of uh, Psalm 119. But over and over, we're told in Scripture it's a blessing, but because we've been raised in a paradigm that tells us something else, that the law is bad, or we don't need the law, or the law's been done away with, or whatever, we're reared in that paradigm, despite the fact that there are hundreds of Scripture verses to the contrary. We're reared in that paradigm, and it's hard to get out of it. People can't see. Most people aren't willing to look beyond the box or the set of rules that they've been reared with. Same thing with polygyny. Well, as they, as the this instructor in class today was talking, these things are all running through my head, and I'm just sitting there really excited about this whole thing, and, and I do want to come back and, and look deeper at the paradigm thing. But among the things that we were told, um, paradigms... Uh, if you stick with a paradigm and information outside of that paradigm is contrary to the reality or, or it is the reality outside of your paradigm is, it is contrary, it will force the paradigm to change eventually. The paradigm has to change to come into alignment with truth or reality or the new information that's out there. You know, for example, watches changed because no longer did we need mechanical watches. Instead, we could be far more accurate with uh, an electronic or atomic uh, watch. Um, so, some things that were expressed about paradigms. Number one, to, to identify something that is contrary to the pa uh, paradigm and to be willing to inspect it is extremely unique. Okay, so for for those who are listening and you have already looked at and you understand that the monogamy only paradigm is broken, it doesn't fit scripture, that makes you unique. But the next thing is is that that paradigm breakers, those who will stand up and take a stand against a paradigm that's false, a lot of times they pay a very high price. It takes a great deal of courage. And the larger the paradigm you're standing against, the more courage it takes because the greater the backlash. And it was very interesting. You know, I'm just sitting there going, yeah, I can relate to that. I know all about that. <laughs> and many of you do as well. Okay, so uh, hats off to you. 
because you saw something that didn't fit, you started digging to figure it out, you were willing to, to, to paddle upstream or against the, you know, move against the grain or whatever in order to find what the real truth is, not just to settle for whatever the old stream or old world uh, paradigm is. But uh, as, uh, as, as our instructor went on talking about this, she was also talking about the fact that, that paradigm shifts are very sudden movements when enough people suddenly start understanding and start taking a taking a look and taking a deep breath and and uh, and a fresh take on things and reassembling the pieces properly or taking into account the new information. In our case, it's not necessarily new information. It's just information we were taught not to see in Scripture, right? Uh, same thing with two house theology. Same thing with uh, with all of Torah. Same thing with the pagan uh, holidays. Same thing with Shabbat versus Sunday. You know, all of these things are paradigm shifts because we're taught to see Scripture one way, and then we're willing to take a look behind the curtain and realize mm, that's not what it says. It says something different. Well, same thing with uh, same thing with um, with the monogamy only paradigm. What we have to understand too, and you know that this wasn't necessarily part of what what our instructor was talking about, but part of it too is the fact that the adversary desires, the adversary uses, the adversary literally needs this false paradigm in order to maintain control and to handle the things that he's doing, right? Well, we when we see this paradigm, now we're not just fighting against you know, the box that uh, that mankind is in, but we're fighting against the very system that the adversary uses for controlling mankind. So, a lot of it very interesting. Um, but uh, the, the big takeaway, I guess, is that when you understand, um, when you understand that there is a, something that doesn't fit, you've got your paradigm, but there's something that doesn't fit, it's worth investigating. It's worth trying to figure out what is the what is really going on here, and how can I, how can I make this piece of information uh, properly fit, properly collate, instead of ignoring the information or finding an excuse for why it doesn't work. Okay. See, a lot of people just want to ignore the information and pretend like it's not there and just make it go away. And that's what Christendom does with Abraham and with Jacob and with Caleb and with Moses and with Gideon and with David, men that God calls righteous, and yet all of them had multiple wives. They're authors of Scripture. They're prophets and priests and kings and patriarchs and great googly moogly. We got the greatest men in the history of the world, and Christendom wants to just close their eyes to it. Pretend like it's not there and y'all think I'm nuts and driving down the road, right? I shouldn't be doing this. Um, but here's the point. Here's the point. The Father's opened our eyes to more information. It's all been there all along. Now what we need to do is to be willing to dig into it, sort it out, figure it out correctly, and then have the chutzpah, the stones, the spine, whatever you want to call it, the guts to stand on it. And not just stand on it, but to stand on it vocally. Um, for many of you, you've started doing your research and you've got pieces and you're starting to look at this going, man, this makes a lot of sense. I will tell you this, the more you research, the more you understand all the pieces, the more you will figure out that the Father's ways work. Always do. He didn't give us a broken system. We broke the system by trying to redesign it in our own wisdom, right? That's what man does. We redesign it in our own wisdom because just because we don't understand something doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means we don't understand it. What we've got to do is learn how to accept what he says and say, that's what the word says. I may not understand it, but I'm going to walk in it and I'm going to trust him and let him sort it out. But I'll tell you this, as you study this more, as you understand it more, you will find, you will come to a place where this becomes such a strong reality where you're so convinced of the truth that, you know what? There's not an ice cube's chance in hell 
that I could back down at this point uh, with regards to with regards to polygyny, because it would be a total lie. Not that I would be a liar. It's that it, it, it's that the the father. It, I would be declaring that his word is a lie, and I can't do that. I can't change what he said. I can't back up. I can't back away from facts and from information that he gave us and from the fact that there is no, there's not a single place anywhere in Scripture where a man is condemned for having more than one wife. It's not there. In fact, there's some places a man is commanded to. But on, on a larger Torah principle, for some of you that are still trying to figure out this Torah thing, um, let me tell you something. There is no place anywhere in Scripture, anywhere, where God judges a man uh, for obedience. Nowhere. There's not a single place in Scripture where this says, if you keep the law, you're going to hell. It's not there. Okay? There's some strong words against oral traditions and the traditions of man and man's laws, but never never, not one time. God's Word says it's a blessing. God's Word says it's truth. God's Word says it's holy and righteous and good, everlasting, um, sweeter than honey, restores the soul, increases length of days. All of those things belong to he who keeps the Torah. Yeah. All of those things belong. It doesn't negate the Messiah. One paradigm doesn't remove the other. The Messiah is the Messiah. And the Messiah did what the Messiah did. And he did that to cover me when I accidentally break the Torah. I'm not saved by my righteousness. I'm obedient because I'm saved. I'm obedient because I belong to him. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Right? So, anyway great class today and diving into the whole uh, whole paradigm thing I would encourage y'all to take a look at this thing from that perspective a paradigm perspective and recognize that what we're doing right now what we're doing is we are showing to the world a different paradigm God's ways are not man's ways and the paradigm that we should seek to follow is his paradigm not that of man or man-made doctrines or man-made design so, fantastic, just excited. A uh, lot of new cool thoughts today just exploding in my head as I was going through this class. And I am so glad that many of you are on this journey of discovery with me, that together we are in the process of changing the world. Which literally, I, I think few of us understand how very huge, what the magnitude of this thing is, okay? We're literally changing the world, but that's what that's what restoring the kingdom is all about, right? It's restoring His ways and preparing for our King. And uh, I, I'll tell you what. Anyway, for King and Kingdom, I bid you shalom.